All right, guys, so we've got one side complete. This was our practice run. Um, so now we are fluent in front hubs. It's been a while since either one of us has done something like this. Actually, you've probably done it a lot more recently, Ben. Oh, my hand. Ben's lagging again. <laughs> has that packet come yet? Getting it. Ben is suffering packet loss. Much more than that. <laughs> Slow downstream speed. So Mr. Ben here is going to show us how to install and recondition a knuckle. Install bearings, seals, basically build it from the ground up Oops. the right way. With both bearings. Yeah. If I can get this. Oh no. To, uh, where's my hammer? Alright, so what's this um, special bush technique you talk about? Okay. Well. Are we about we'll, to find out? You will soon find out. The trouble is the... Um, Success rate low. <laughs> it's a different type of bush technique. This um, this fork isn't thick enough to get... That finds water, doesn't it? That, that top. <laughs> well, that's um, <laughs> divination or whatever they call it. Apparently that works. Someone was telling me. They it learned it in um, bush, bush survival. Learned it in bush mechanics. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, this um, this fork isn't thick enough to um, separate the ball joint. It just goes in there, and it, it, it's got quite a tall stem. So I thought, should I need the lumpy? So I thought we'll give it. Come on, Brett. We'll um, give it the old heave ho and see what happens. Ball's hammer. Ball's hammer. So the other side happened in a in a heartbeat. Normally, when you do that, the joint just pops out, but clearly not in this example. Bang! It all snaps in half. <laughs> so anyway, that's pretty impressive. I saw that at a wrecking yard once. I thought that's an awesome idea. Just beat oh, the maybe. fuck out of it. Yeah, yeah have well, fun, and it serves a purpose. Mi micro cracks through the whole thing. But, uh, <laughs> well, I figure that's why they have these pads here. See, they've got two flat pads on either side. Oh, yeah. So the clean so, this up. So we've got that out. Um, what we'll do is get most of the dirty grease out of here because we're gonna keep this oil seal. So if you're following, I think you have to order these OE because um, yeah, Auto One had no fucking idea. We couldn't, we couldn't find them anywhere. So. And you'll have to explain to everyone how that seal arrangement works too, Ben. Oh, right. Okay. Let me clean this up first. So, in the back of the steering knuckle, there's a, a sealing arrangement which includes an oil seal, which is what this is. Um, a rubber lip with a, with a garter spring. Right. And then, uh, backup <laughs> camera. And uh, on the CV side, there's a... Um, like a um, CV collar or a shaft collar which holds a V-ring seal and that total assembly together is commonly referred to as a taconite arrangement so that's where you have Can you spell that? T-A-C-O-N-I-T-E oh. That's the word of today uh, So taconite, so what happens is you've got this oil seal here which stops um, the lube from coming out from inside this area here and then to stop any contaminants coming in we have this surface, which is why I've made an effort to make it really nice and clean. And then we have the rotating part, which goes on the CV. So this, this type is a tight fit to the CV. And you can see here, we've got a V-ring. So it's a V-ring because it's got a V cross section. We couldn't get any today, it's Sunday. Um, and it needs to be ordered OE through Toyota or a Toyota supply. There's no aftermarket ones that we could find. So this is in decent condition, we're gonna reuse it. So basically what happens is this V-ring part rubs on this uh, flat surface here. And then the, there's a, a seat on the CV which seals against this O-ring part, um, sorry, this oil seal part here. And then this folded press metal part 
is a is a cover that goes over the whole lock. So it sits in like that, and it's pressed again. So you can see that's the springiness of the V-ring. So the formed steel forms a labyrinth, and then there's a V-ring. Impenetrable. There. Oh, hardly, <laughs> but better than nothing. Uh, and the and the grease lubricates this surface here. So the reason we bothered to explain that is this ring needs to be a tight fit onto the CV so that it, it gets driven around. This surface here where the V-ring um, rubs against the sheet steel here needs to be really clean and lubricated with fresh grease. And of course this part here needs to be lubricated um, with fresh grease and then um, a molly type grease for the bronze bushing. So that's mm. a thrust surface here against the CV. We'll have a look at the CV later. And then this is a bearing surface on the inside here. So these grooves are like a grease reservoir. So we're gonna make sure all of that is nice and clean and in good condition. Yep. And also the bottom ball joint here, you can see mm. it's really rusty and in a really bad shape. So the other side, when we cleaned it up, we saw that um, the surface wasn't flat. There was a lot of uh, marks on here. So the ball joint flange wasn't sitting flat. Hence the rust. Yeah, so that, that's where it's not flat, it's not sitting properly and the water can creep in. So we're gonna wire brush that whole area there and then remove any nicks and burrs with a file, make sure it's perfectly flat. And then on this spigot inside here, we'll put some anti-fretting paste and then reassemble the whole lot. You see how good the wire wheel is? So we're just checking out the spindle. And what you can see, so this is the bottom side of the spindle, there's the lower um, ball joint. And what you can see here is the wear from where the wheel bearing sits on this section here. You can see there's a little groove worn in there. So it's actually, technically it's really under spec, but we're gonna rework it and reuse it. So one of the ways you can help to prevent this is to adjust your wheel bearings properly, not have them too loose, um, but also uh, to use a bit of anti-fretting paste, which I'll show you later on. So when you set up the wheel bearings, it's always um, a balancing act. So if you set them too tight, they can run hot really quickly. But if you set them too loose, you won't immediately know, apart from maybe if you're really in tune with your car and you have good steering systems, um, you'll feel it be a little bit wandering around. Um, you'll feel it wander around, I should say, but it doesn't overheat and, and you won't know straight away unless you actually check it properly. But this is one of the side effects you'll wear through the spindle because you have excessive axial play and that, that bearing is gonna move around on the seat. Whereas um, the other one is generally better retained up on this shoulder. So I'm gonna just remove that lip there and rework it a little bit. Get some emery, a little bit of lubricant. And then just, just like this. I don't wanna to take too much material off, but just take off that. that little bit of a lip there. Visually you can see it, but gloves. The high step from that worn edge um, is mostly removed. So I'll just go over a bit more. And this area here, because this area is the area that the um, axle hub seal will run on. You can see it's full of gunk there. And then once you clean it up, you'll see that there's that line where the existing seal ran there. So if you're not getting a really good seal, it's because that mm. That's worn. So they do sell replacement spindles for that reason, but also this reason here. However, if you just want to resurface this, you can get a speedy sleeve that'll go over that. Okay, so um, anti-fretting paste. So I put that, uh, just a thin smear on this flange and on the spigot where that lower ball joint goes. So you can see that's all coated now. So we shouldn't have any disassembly problems later on. So that's all set. Now what we're going to do is fit this ring up to the CV and make sure that's fitted properly. So here's the CV and this ring fits up here as we were talking about before. Because it's a used one it's come off another CV, it is a little bit loose so what I'm going to do is put some retaining compound there to make sure it stays. The idea is that goes on there, the um, oil seal will run on here this surface here will run on the bronze bush, this one and this one here, and then the bearing will sit um, over the over the stub axle on that on that shaft. 
Yeah, which you'll see very soon. <clears throat> which you'll see. So we also have to clean the hub up, but first I'm going I'll get to you some... put some attachment down here and we'll let that sit. While, um, yep. 6.48. The important thing is that's right up against the shoulder, which it is. So we'll leave that there and let that set um, while we fix up the hub. All right, guys, so this is the uh, bearing kit for the front wheel on this car in particular. So what you get, obviously, your oil seal. Um, various gaskets for different types of hubs, I'm guessing. We've got this, what's this, a locking? That's a spare lock washer for adjusting the wheel bearings. Yeah, but, but the, normally the, the other kit comes with them, doesn't it? Yeah, other kit comes with them, but if you do need to readjust them, it's worth having spares, so we'll hang on to that as well. Small one. So these are the wheel bearing kits, two of them. Um, so we'll put these aside ready for when the hub's ready. So put them here. We don't take them out of the pack until we're ready to use them. Our first step is to push, push out the old uh, cups. So this is the old cup seated in there. And we've done a good job. You can see there's little cutouts where you can put a position, a pin punch there to push them out. So we're going to push it out, clean the hub up, get rid of this old gasket, um, and then press in the new hub. So first up, just line up your pin punch. Get, get our friend the lumpy. Good smack. So normally it takes a bit to get them moving. Once they're moving, it's pretty easy. Just keep them coming out square. So that's one old one come out. So normally I always take a look at it and have a bit of a look see. Being the bearing king that you are. Curiosity killed the cat. Satisfaction brought it back. <laughs> so you can see there's the part number, LM102910. I'm just gonna check that. LM102910, so definitely the right one. That was some Amma Ando brand, never heard of that at all. So let's throw it over here. Then we'll press it the other side. So when we pulled the other side apart, these ones look brand new. So you can see there's a running track all the way up to the end there. So the loop may not have been the best, but that looks pretty good, so nothing really wrong with that. This is a different brand again. <laughs> These were the ones that came out from the other side, and interesting to note, see that? That's corrosion etching, so that's water that's gone in there, and that's classic corrosion etching, and that would have um, failed in due course if it continued with that. These have been modified, so uh, we mm. threw them on the lathe and took a bit off the outside diameter, so they're, um, they're really trend easy fit, so they're not gonna get stuck and we'll use them as pressing tools to get that the- my eye mate. Beautiful, <laughs> bang on. Um, so we'll use these as pressing tools for later on. Okay, so now onto the really boring part. I gotta get rid of this gasket, peel that up. Yep. I might stop the camera for this bit. <laughs> I thought you were here for the whole. For I'm the here. Run. The camera's not. <laughs> so anyway, we're pretty fortunate with this one. It's all coming off in one piece. Mm. Okay, so we're gonna prepare the CV joint uh, for the steering knuckle. So what I'm doing is putting um, some lithium grease on this seal oil seal running surface, and also on the V ring. It's all greased up. Then I'm going to grease up the spindle on the back side here where the seal runs. Okay, so that's the V ring running surface. I'm also going to put a bit on the lip seal. So there's two lips in there. Two lips are better than one. Absolutely. Just make sure you get all of that lube between the lips. And the next step I'll prepare now. Oh. Next step is we're going to put molly grease on this um, 
bronze bush. So on the thrust surface here and into that groove. They're both lithium complex base greases, so they're perfectly compatible. If you're using different greases like we are, make sure that they're the same base and that they're miscible. And also on the bronze bush on the front. Okay, <clears throat> I've got that sorted. Gonna line that up. Give that little wiggle and then come down and place it on the knuckle. Just like that. So that's all sorted in there now. And we'll run the bolts in through the bottom so it's all secured. Drop in that top uh, ball joint and into the space that we're running on the top. Bolt that all through. Once the spindle's up and secured, then we'll set up the rest of the axle and fit the trailing link. Um, and the steering links, calipers and so forth. So I'm just preparing our new ball joints uh, to go in. And one of the things I noticed is when you take the castle nut off, that's the castle nut, it's like a castle. When it's mounted up, the uh, hole for the cotter pin is in a really silly place because what it, what it means is that it's gonna go this way and you can't get the pin from the back, and if you put, or the outside, and if you put it in from the inside, it's very hard to get the two pins to flare them out. So what I'm gonna do is just rotate that, and the easiest way to do it is just to put an Allen key through the hole. Just grab the ring spanner and just twist that. Twang. <laughs> and it's always stiff to start off. So now, the hole is running this way. So when I install the ball joint, I can put the cotter pin through the front side and then flare the legs out around the back. So it's much easier to get access to when you're installing it and removing it and it just makes a lot more sense. So when you line up any of these linkages or um, tie rod ends and you have the hole for the cotter pin, before you shove it into the hole, just check which way the, um, the cotter pin hole is facing. Rightio, next step is to put the backing plate, which is this bit here. I'm going to fit that up, so that goes like that. There's the space for the two calipers. Uh, for the two caliper bolts, I should say. <laughs> and here's the um, oil seal, or the sealing ring. So, if you know, it's actually on a different, um, the holes aren't drilled equally, so that the ring only fits one way, and that's with a little hole to the bottom. What is that little hole for, do you know? I've no idea. just an indexing? Um, I can't see that it does anything, so it looks just like an indexing hole. Yeah, cool. Try not to drop all the screws. I've got a fistful of screws. So I'm trying to be coordinated. So what I normally do is put all of them in first loose, and that will help to align everything. So just doing another lube run while I remember. So I'm gonna put this lithium grease on all the areas where the seals run. So inside there. making sure that it's not just smeared everywhere but it's actually between the two uh, rubber lips of the seal. And the two bearing seats um, here and here. So this is just an anti-fretting paste. And Where could people get this from Ben? Uh, you can get them from any of your local bearing distributors. So like um, Statewide Bearing, CBC or an Inco. Any of those kind of places, they should have it on the shelf. Um, we'll be able to get it for you. So it's just called anti-fretting paste. Um, you can also get it in Loftite brand and so on. But basically, it's a thick uh, lubricant type paste that stops the wear on the journals and helps the bearings to go on as well. There All you the go. small things matter. Yeah, it just helps. Um, with the longevity of the components, they're probably fine when they're really brand new, but it's the second and third service life where they start to get worn like that step that was on the underside that we reworked mm -hmm. earlier. So, you know, it's not that expensive. I think it's 70 gram tubes, about 20 bucks. So it goes a really long way and it's worth just um, doing the little things along the way and it helps the assembly uh, a, lot, uh, a lot. Especially if you're planning on keeping the vehicle because it makes it easier to service later on as well. 
Yeah, so all the critical bolts, um, we've either used Loctite to stop them falling out or anti-seize to stop them binding up uh, when we want to service them. And yeah, just taking care of all the seals so we don't have to, hopefully don't have to come back here and do things twice. So next step is we'll um, get the wheel hub all cleaned up, the bearings knocked in and the seals and the rear uh, seal. Brake rotor. Brake rotor goes onto the to the hub first. You have to fit that because once you set the hub on, you can't put the brake rotor on. It goes from. It's not like a normal side. car where you chuck the hub on and then the brake rotor slots yeah. over it. Yeah. Um, the brake rotor bolts to the hub, and then the hub with the bearings are installed. So um, we'll put the bearings in, then we'll bolt the hub up, and then come here and fit them. And of course, brake caliper and steering link. So let's get stuck in. Bit of anti fretting again for the. Uh that's outboard it. cup. That's it. Don't fret, guys. It's all under control. So that's all. The other surface to be really careful with is this surface here, which is what that um, seal lip runs on. So you can see it's got a groove in it already from a previous service life. Again, you can speedy sleeve it, or um, in this case, we're just going to clean it right up and then put it back and see how it goes. Okay, so we've prepared the um, axle hub. Uh, I've just started knocking in the inboard race, or, um, the cup, and here's our modified um, old bearing. So it's been reduced down, we've machined down the outside diameter so that it doesn't um, jam on there. And basically we're going edge to edge, plus just a mandrel so that I can hit it square in the center. And I'm just gonna push it in. So one of the tricks is if you have enough room, you can put your fingers like that. Careful, if it's a really small gap, don't do it because you can pinch your, <laughs> pinch your fingers and they'll really suck. But um, in this case, I know what I'm doing and there's a, more than enough gap there. I'm not going to get pinched and I can feel it going through. What you'll find is as you go down, eventually you'll end up against the seat and the sound will change. Just like that. It doesn't always flip like that, but you can hear the sound change. So now it's solid. <clears throat> and because we've reduced that ring down, it doesn't get caught on the bearing seat. So visual inspection. So visual inspection. If you look through, you can see the um, cup is hard up against that abutment shoulder there. And we put mounting paste in and you can actually see the mounting paste is squeezed out a little bit. Um, so that confirms that it's fully seated. If you've got a small pair of um, 100 mil feeler blades, you can get the 40 micron ones and just put them, see if you can feel for a gap with feeler blades between the cup and the abutment shoulder. So that's another way to check as well. But here visually I can tell that it's already seated. Yeah. That's just another way to do the same thing. So I'll do the same thing on here, make sure your gloves are clean. Get the other bearing out. So here's the bearing and I'll leave everything in the packet and just take out the ring that I need so that it doesn't get contaminated. Hopefully you're good with a hammer, don't hit the studs and burr it up. <laughs> so that There's last one, you can, you can hear it. Solid. You can pluck the ring out. Very handy to make tools that help this installation from yeah. old. If you've got a lathe handy, Lathe is job. one of the best tools that you can have uh, for this type of thing. And you can see it's nicely seated right up against the shoulder there. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is come back to this side, get a clean rag and make sure that's all clean, and grease up a bearing to drop in there. So this is when we get messy. Hopefully not too messy. So uh, remember I was keeping the cone inside the protective plastic, so it's time to take it out now. So what we're going to do is um, traditional wheel bearing packing. So I'm going to fill my palm with fresh grease. But what I want to do is I want to press the grease in through this opening here. So it goes in between the, roll, um, the rollers and the raceway. And I'll know that's successful when it comes out the top here. Okay. So start off with a palm full of grease. I'm going to grab the bearing like that. Basically what I'm going to do is just scrape it like that and collect more and more grease and push it through. And you can see it's starting to come through there. See this next row has come through like that. Keep going. The next one around has come through. And that's how I know that the grease is thoroughly gone through. 
if you just smear it in grease like that, you can see that it doesn't actually get into where it's required. So on startup, the, the hardest part um, or the most difficult part of the bearing to lubricate is actually between the roller end and that flange inside there where the roller end rides up against it. So it's really important that you get the grease to come through all the way so that it lubricates on that shoulder. So basically what we're using is a lithium complex grease. Um, I chose a lithium complex because it's uh, popular, easy to get hold of and it's also compatible with the um, molybdenum grease that we're also using for the other surfaces. And some red is faster. <laughs> and red is faster. So some people use a high temperature grease, HTB. Basically the difference is the um, thickener is a different material. Normally it's a um, clay product, so benchmark clay and so on. It has um, a higher temperature resistance, so above 260 odd degrees. However, it's not miscible with normal lithium complex. So you have to be careful what you're putting it in with because the issue with greases that aren't miscible is that when they mix together, you get an unpredicted result. So it may lose lubricity, it may stiffen up, it may uh, soften up, may end up um, with some sort of undesired result. So I've fully packed the bearing with grease and one of the ways you can tell is because now it's quite stiff. And this is one of the reasons before you set your bearing preload, you need to make sure that you work the grease in and it's not the friction of the grease that you're measuring, it's actually the bearing preload. So all I'm going to do now, I know that's thoroughly grease, I'm just going to coat the rollers with the leftover grease, make sure everything's fully coated. And then I'm going to seat it down in the cup here. So that's seated there, and just work it in a little bit. I'm um, just get the rest of that excess grease so I'm not wasting it. And I'm going to put a thin smear around here. So just filling that gap there. You see there's a counterbore shoulder here. That's where the seal element sits. So I'm just going to paste the grease into that gap there. Now, I've seen some people, they fully pack this whole thing and jam it full of grease. It's not a great idea because when it starts up, the grease needs to egress. So there is way more grease in the bearing than what the bearing actually needs to lubricate itself. The key is getting the grease to the right parts of the bearing. So if you've jam packed this whole area, what happens is with the taper roller, so <clears throat> if I use one of my samples as an example, so this is installed like that. You have the cone that we've just put in and the seal element here. <clears throat> when, that's, when the inner ring spins up, it wants to pump the grease outwards this way. Okay, and if you've left no space there, it'll be jam packed um, and all that grease will push out and sit against the seal element. So we actually have quite good seal elements here, which sit behind the, um, behind the bearing. And what will happen is the grease will come up against here. You've already fully packed it. It can't come out and it will tend to run hot because of the extra friction. Sometimes people can incorrectly assume that was because of excessive preload rather than the inability of the grease to get out. So what happens is you cook the grease, so now the grease loses lubricity and doesn't have um, the life that it was supposed to. But then they're also tempted to back off the end play. When they back off the end play, the whole assembly moves and you get a bit more room down there and you reduce the temperature and you think, okay, it's fixed. But actually what happens is now you're running the bearing with too much clearance and the um, the assembly will have a short life and you'll also end up with um, sometimes excessive wear on the spindle shaft which is expensive and time consuming to replace so just be careful with that i only pack it just so that it's smeared and flush and then i'll clean off all the excess grease before um, i put the seal on okay so i've put uh, the antifreeing paste on the board just because it's easier while it's um, while the seal's out and uh, i've put anaerobic sealant just to help it what is it, uh, 518? Yeah. Yep. Anaerobic sealant. So we're using a different fitting tool because the, lip, the rubber lip here actually protrudes a little bit. So I want to press just on the outside. I happen to have this handy tool, so I'm going to use it. Just a gentle tap to get it seated. <clears throat> then just make sure it's square. 
You can see as it go, it's going in. Anaerobic sealant means that it sets in the absence of oxygen. So, it is more expensive to use. It has less, less body than your normal RTV, but it doesn't set um, solid unless it's being squeezed between a surface. Mm. So You could also use Permatex number two, non-hardening. Non-hardening, yeah, uh, which I often use as well. Seeing as we have that one here, I'll use that. And I've just cleaned up that surface, so that's all nice and clean and flush with the edge. So <clears throat> next thing I'm going to do, a clean glove, I'm going to lubricate that uh, lip seal with grease. All right, I'm going to go get that rotor. <clears throat> so, seal's in, uh, seal lips lubricated. I've put some antifreeing paste on the spigot here where the um, disc bolts down to. So this is the lead-in chamfer. So what we're gonna do is put that over. And Again, it's different to how you would conventionally think it would run, but. So I'm just gonna line it up there real lightly and run the bolts through first, just so that it's all lined up. Very important that that seating surface is flat too. Yeah, flat and clean and the, the inside of the spigot, um, all any rust and corrosion is scraped away. So I've got all the threads started. And I'm just gonna lightly nip them up. Going on the fly here, so a couple of duggers will do. Oh, we didn't put Loctite. Yeah, I thought you were pulling them back out to do that. Sure. That's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's sounds like, That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, doing the responsible thing and seeding it first. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually. Prevent any confusion and pull all the off that. <laughs> Except your nozzle's blocked again. Okay, so we're gonna put it up now, and you see we've made sure that surface is really nice and clean. And slide that on. And this is the bearing seat. Ooh, that sound. So try to roll it as you slide it in so that um, you don't flip that lip on the inboard side, but that looks pretty good. You can see the grease is being worked around there. And uh, we'll just put that outer bearing, grease it up, just like you saw before, and slide that on as well. Okay, so next up, um, locking off the wheel bearing assembly. So we've got our uh, washer here, little tab, I've just greased the back side of that, and that indexes on this slot here. So we'll put that up onto the slot, push that all the way back. Next we fit one of these um, locking nuts and again I'm just going to put a bit of grease on the face and a little bit on the threads. And this is the tricky part here. Now this is all aftermarket kit. Sometimes it takes a little bit to get it started. Just be careful. This one started pretty well. And um, we're not using a cold chisel or anything, we've got the special nut. I think it's 55 millimeters. It doesn't cost much, guys. Oh, if you know you're going to be doing this job in advance, just buy. I think it even came with the kit. Yeah, I think from you, memory. you get the whole kit and it's all included. Yeah. So, it takes half inch socket. It's good to carry in the car as well if you ever need to do a roadside repair. So, we can see that's still free. First thing I'm going to do is get that really tight. Seat everything. Yep. By hand, not with an impact rattle gun. Uh, I don't want to tear the threads on the nut and I don't want to um, brunel the bearing so just want to make sure it's nice and tight and then I'm going to back it off. So now it's a bit much freer then I'm going to torque that up. So check your field service manual for the instructions. From memory first step is 40 pound feet. 41, somewhere like that. Basically, all you're doing is it's just a controlled um, torque for setting to be tight. So I've gone a little bit past 41 or 40 there. Check that. Now what I'm going to do is just really work that backwards and forwards so that the grease is all settled in. And you'll feel the, the friction under your hand become a lot more consistent. Okay, 
so that's set. Next thing is I'm going to back that off and now I'm going to tighten it up to 20 pound feet as a starting point. So I get them up, come in. 20 pound feet. So there we are. Now this next step is step setting the rolling torque of the bearing. So everything's seated down there now, nice and freely. It's got a pretty consistent torque. So what I'm gonna do is get a strap, which I've left somewhere here. From memory, according to the manual, it's at the pitch of the bolt. So to make it easy, I'm gonna use this surface here. So basically what you're doing is you're measuring the force exerted to create a rolling motion. So we're measuring the linear force at a certain distance from the axis. Also from memory, <clears throat> the spec is no more than 12 pounds force. So I'm gonna get it going. And you see there the rolling torque is about eight pounds. So I'm gonna And that's the it, constant torque, the not constant the initial. Torque. Yeah, so not the initial torque. So I'm gonna tighten that a bit more. So we use a similar thing when we set up the diffs, if you guys have seen in previous episodes. Now I've got a rolling torque about 10. And they say no more than 12. So that's about 10. Reasonably happy with that. I want it set slightly on the tighter side so that when the assembly wears in, um, there's room to go. So that, and that's a pretty firm torque setting there. So I'll just test it again. Nice and consistent, it's about 10. So that's good for me. That's why you wear steel caps. Yep. That's exactly where you want it. It's set to the right um, preload. Next step is the locking washer. So this is the locking washer. And you're gonna put that, oh, where's the groove there? Yeah. Um, as this turns up on the NAR, one of these tabs will line up with the flat and then we fold it over the flat to stop it undoing. I'm just going to carefully watch him behind so I don't add extra preload. I'm gonna jam the nut against itself. So that's pretty tight. And I look around, I say, okay, that one's perfectly lined up. That one's missed. That's definitely missed, that's definitely missed. This one is just fractionally off. It's already pretty firm, but if I just give it that little bit extra to clamp it all together, I'll line up with that one and then I'll lock it off. All right guys, so there's one more step, which as you probably noticed, is a different day. Um, the next one is there's this little splined ring and also a snap ring. Um, the reason why we're not doing this, we didn't do it when we originally shot this stuff, is because we didn't have it. So I've basically gone on Amayama and sold out every single one from Mr. Toyota. So you've got this splined ring uh, that will go on here. And that's got a little bit of molly grease on it too. So that's that. And then we need a snap ring. So if anyone's interested, that is the, the part number for the ring. The snap ring, I should say. That's the number for the spacer, one of them. Um, you can actually see the whole schematic if you go on the Amayama website. So what we're gonna do is put this snap ring on and it's key not to stretch these too much. Only the bare minimum. Try and slide it down the shaft. And you might just have to push the CV from the back, and from the inside, like the engine side. And then you'll hear that kind of snap in. And the indicator that it is in properly is that it will, it will spin around like so. So that is in now. And you can see, so that basically just holds the um, CV in its place. It stops it going in and out. So, the only thing we're gonna do now is put this cover back on. So I'm gonna grab the gasket, some of my 518 anaerobic sealant, and also, yeah, splines are greased in molly. So we'll chuck this back on, we'll put this last bolt in, and then we're done. All right, so a bit of anaerobic sealant both sides of the gasket. 
This stuff works fucking wonders. Whack your keepers in. Fuck, these things are tight. Nuts on. Alright, so last step is I always like to chuck some anaerobic or at least some kind of non-hardening sealant on this cover. Stops any ingress of water, dirt, whatever. All the stuff you encounter on the trails. Actually, you know what, before I do that I should actually probably put this bolt in. So that goes on there. Uh, normally you've got one big thick washer, but I forgot to get that, so I've got two doubled up, which should do the exact same thing. There we go. If you're putting new rotors on, which I highly recommend if you're actually going to do this whole hub assembly, unless your rotors are basically new, um, obviously once it's on, get the brake cleaner and clean both sides. I'll just rotate this around, rub it down in the spot that the caliper goes because you can get the full reach, the full depth of the uh, rotor. And then it's basically a time of putting on your caliper. All right, so wheel bearings are done, brakes are on. So it's now just a matter of bleeding the brakes, which uh, Ben's been kind enough to bring his power brake bleeder. So should make quick work of everything. Always, always, always use DOT3 in your Toyota. And some other makes, I'm not sure exactly, but basically DOT3 is a lubricating brake fluid, slash clutch fluid. If you use DOT4, what happens, Benny? No. Oh, Leakies. <laughs> you spend time replacing things. <laughs> well, I had to anyway. All right, guys, well, I hope you found that informational and obviously helpful. Um, we're gonna go take this car for a drive now because I still haven't really driven it except for off a trailer and down the driveway. So we'll go bed these brakes in.